Massive thank you as always to our top tier patrons, Sarah Turner and Alexander Lashley. For as little as $3, you can gain access to patron-only episodes, as well as access to our Discord server, where we host weekly live discussions with host Ekoi Hero and myself. So if you like what you hear, come join us at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. We're on Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode or the podcast in general, then email it's not just in your head at gmail.com. Today, psychotherapist Harriet Fraud and substance abuse counselor Ekoi Hero talk with a therapist working with autistic children using applied behavior analysis. The conversation covers its methods and, most importantly, its major problems. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Before we even begin, it would be good for our audience if you explained what is autism? How are autistic people different from people who are not autis- autistic? Sure. Okay. In its most basic form, it's just like, you know, sort of like a social ineptitude, really. And it kind of comes down to, you know, how severe it, it is. Autism has recently like taken on a way more broad spectrum and things like Asperger's and stuff like that are just like high end autism, which is kind of just like being, you know, a little awkward, maybe like missing out on some social cues, stuff like that. Um, And it can range as far as like people with autism wanting like literally almost nothing to do with other people, (laughs) like just sort of being in their own world, in their own place. And yeah, and ABA is, is, is a way to hopefully, uh, Reach, reach them and and show them you know the power of of being able to socialize and stuff like that yeah i wonder though what is social avoidance can be momentary it can be uh permanent it there must be some definition that people recognize even when they have an infant if this infant has Asperger's. So would you talk a little <laughs> Asperger's autism so would you talk a little bit more about that what autism is and how it functions beginning in infancy? Most, I, if I'm not, I might be mistaken here, but um, even to get a diagnosis of autism, a child has to be at least like, I think it's three. You wouldn't uh, typically see the science, like science earlier than that. Maybe, maybe that's changed, but um, most of it is like when, when a child would start like socializing with other kids, you know, that's when it's, or, or even like the, the relationships with their parents. And how are they different? Maybe they don't pick up on social cues. Maybe they, again, they don't necessarily care about other people's presence. They don't want to interact with them, uh, things like that. Can they be held and caressed the way usual children are, or do they take offense at that? It depends. Yeah, it's a developmental disorder, or at least it's it's currently in the category of like cognitive and de- de- developmental disability, rather than like you know a mental health issue. I mean, one of the major features of of autism is like repetitive behaviors. Again, like it's a spectrum disorder, so there are children that do not mind a lot of physical touch, but it's also a lot of the symptoms, you know, that's felt by the autistic person is a lot of sensory disorders and sensory hypersensitivity. Yes, is yep, that's a true huge, too. Yeah, that's a, it, it tends to be a big part of the autism spectrum disorder. So depending on like, you know, a lot of times that's why, you know, you see headphones, noise blocking, canceling headphones is, is one, one tool that people use to help manage the, the sensory excess that they perceive um but yeah it it depends on like there are a couple of of key traits but how that manifests individually is it can be highly individual is the sensory disability only on touch or is it across the other senses it's it's across the other senses though they often have you know they can be very very picky about food food yes the food food is a huge thing for sure yeah, fabric is a, a huge, I mean, like, you know, the, the entire noise, you know, I, I know one person that is very, very sensitive to light 
Yeah. And, and touch is another one for sure. Some learners like do not want to be touched at all. Of course, like friendly, like pat on the shoulder, you know, high five, hug, kind of that, like, like socially appropriate kind of stuff. But like still, yeah, don't want anything to do with it. To Iko, uh, Ikoya's point about the texture for food, it's that's a huge one too. There's a lot of feeding programs and stuff like that to try and get learners to diversify their diets and um, stuff like that because a lot of times they do they simply just will not eat different things. I, I, I met a, one learner who refused to eat anything that wasn't green. They would only eat green stuff. And we had to like make a program and, and everything to you know diversify the diet. Of course, everyone needs their greens, but like if that's all you're eating, it's like obviously not enough. Right. So this is it. This is getting into the ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. I don't know if you know what the sort of founding history is, or but basically that would be interesting to know maybe if you know it, but otherwise just what is it um, and what's it sort of designed to help with? You mentioned programs there. The godlike figure within the field of ABA is B.F. Skinner and the work that he did uh, with classical conditioning and everything. And a lot of people that I've met at least are like, B.F. Skinner's the man, like he's the dude. And they like really idolize this guy for, and that sort of like set off the whole like behavior movement. And I think from there, it turned into ABA and how to use the science of, of behaviorism and applying it to learners to, to teach them basically based off of uh, observable behaviors and modify and behavior modification based off of uh, B.F. Skinner's principles. Right. So B.F. Skinner is a bit of a, uh, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of yeah, different opinions pariah, about, yeah. about that dude. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so yeah. what in, inside, you know, the space that you work in, it sounds like it's like 99, maybe <laughs> percent. Generally speaking, people are like, that guy's got it. Are like, are there any sort of detractors to the B.F. Skinner thing or what's the, what's your take on it all? So I will say this, like, I, I used to work in the field in Florida. And for some reason, like there was a lot of people there that were like, this man's the bomb. He's like, he's the best. But uh, I've, I've been living in New York now for a few years. And I will say like, it's not, I wouldn't say it's 99%, but there are definitely people that are like totally obsessed with him. There's definitely something I had read that I'd probably want to come back to, like stick a pin in BF Skinner and come back to because sure. putting aside the whether B.F. Skinner is a good guy or a bad guy. <laughs> um, in, in ABA, what are the methods then for behavioral change? How does that take place? Because potentially, I imagine it can be hugely beneficial for the individual and the families, but also I can see a sort of slightly sort of dystopian thing with behavior change. It sounds like in the wrong hands, it could be kind of scary, which is sort of the point I'll get back to later on. Um, yes, and you're absolutely correct about that for sure. Right. So yeah, in terms of in terms of methods, um, yeah, yeah. What, what are they? How do they? How do they work? Okay. So positive reinforcement is the backbone, I guess, of uh, of how we use ABA because it it has shown proven that it is the most effective in behavior modification. Um, and positive reinforcement is basically just like uh, you get something something preferred. For exhibiting like behavior that that the teacher I guess wants to see and teacher I'm using kind of loosely not like an official teacher just like someone who teaches you know like your dad teaches you how to ride a bike or go fishing like that so depending on what the teacher wants you to what, what wants the child to learn and positive reinforcement the example that you will hear the most for it and sort of where I I see the issue with it the example always given is. We go to work, right? We work our hours, we get paid hourly. And then every couple of weeks, we get the paycheck in, in our bank accounts. And that paycheck reinforces the behavior of going back to work the following <laughs> week, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, and you'll hear this example <clears throat> time and time again. The problem with that example, in my opinion, is that we're not earning money for fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? The money that we earn, only a small fraction of it is for like, things that we actually enjoy. Most of it is just to survive. Yeah. Paying your bills, buying food, electricity, blah, blah, blah. So I think that example, even though it's widely used, kind of also shows the problem with ABA, right? That we we put these expectations on our learners that even like 
typical learning people don't even like to participate in necessarily. You know, like a lot of a lot of people really don't like their jobs, and the only reason why they go is so that they can feed themselves and and support themselves. So to apply that framework to a a learner who doesn't necessarily, I don't know if care is the right word, but like maybe doesn't understand, they just want to enjoy themselves. So it's just difficult to start from there. Is the positive behavior that you're talking about, the positive reinforcement, is that count emotional approval or is it just things, tokens? It's tokens. Yeah. So, so for the most part, it would be tokens. Um, a lot of times we use, uh, conditioning in the same way, um, that like, so say, say a child really loves, I I won't go into the food because that's a whole separate, um, issue, but let's just say, um, they really love, I don't know, a game on an iPad. Let's just, and so, you know, in the same sense that we go to work 40 hours a week, we get the money. This child is able to perform certain things, do certain things. And then at the end of that, that they know that they get the iPad. So they may not necessarily like doing the, the things required, but at least at the end of it, they get the iPad, something that they enjoy. What that brings up for me is that I had a dear friend who was in charge of a school for emotionally disturbed children. And one of them came back afterwards and said, you know, I want to come back and see you because the other the other teachers would give me a candy bar or something, but you believed in me. It wasn't just shit. It was you believed in me and you thought I was somebody. And that counted a lot more than a candy bar. But does the candy bar count more for autistic children than the approval and the belief in someone? Right. Um, so... Uh, I would say it depends again on the learner. On, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, there is no one model of, you know, autistic children, just like there's no singular model of, say, an ADHD child. Um, because, yeah, one of the major criticisms, right, of, of ABA is I remember um, seeing this was also actually on a, a Twitter discussion that I was reading a while back that, you know, it, it's a four, it's kind of like, conversion therapy but for autistic children whoa you know so because it's about mimicking neurotypical behavior right Right, exactly Um, rather than you know kind of being supportive of like their sensory um issues and kind of trying to get them comfortable and you know, focus on their strength rather than enforce, you know, people to kind of parrot and mimic a behavior. Yeah, that's, that's exactly true. And you could even, uh, you could even like boil it down to even just like compliance training. Right. And and you could even, you could even really see that in, in the example that I was making about our society right now and the economy that we work in. Right. Like a lot of us, don't like to work. They don't like their jobs, but we still do it because we've been we've been trained almost, right? That compliance factor. Yeah, I mean, reading reading sort of an overhead view of the the methods with ABA, I'm just like, well, this is just very similar to um, uh, a lot of people's upbringing, which is like yep. you you are being rewarded for doing what someone else wants you to do, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> not right. what you necessarily want to do. However, that is a part of socialization, right? Like if it was just about you, potentially we wouldn't even have any kind of civilization. Like there is always a part of you that has to get sanded off so that you can play well with others. So I guess that's the difficult bit is where is the line between some kind of socialization and sort of enforcing someone to act in a way that they don't want to. Also, it's not like people's expectations are uniform. Yep, that's that's another issue. If you grow up in a family, depending on the mood of the person that you're trying to please, you could be pleasing or not. And there isn't a consistent pattern that goes from person to person of what's pleasing. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, that that is that is a key question I wanted to ask you because as far as I understood it from reading about ABA is that your role is to facilitate 
these these behavior change alongside the family, right? So there's there's the family, mm-hmm. the child, and the and there's you. Although this does this method does work for adults as well, right? But it's more focused on children. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It, it's almost. I mean, most of the funding goes to kids. It's most of the focus is on kids, and it yeah. So right. Kids. So you're you're in between. You're facilitating all of this stuff. So I can imagine there must be a huge amount of expectation placed on the process, placed on you. Like, how do you navigate that area? Because, as you know, how it sort of getting to an equi was as well, which is just that idea of I can imagine a lot of parents weren't prepared for having an autistic child. Right. And there might be all kinds of emotional baggage that comes with that. And then you have to enter the scene. And how do you deal with expectations? And, and what is that experience like? What is that landscape? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Because um, you're basically getting to the heart of of really, I think, what the problem the problems with ABA is. And that is that the success of the child is... is they they bring their own uh, abilities and you know deficits or whatever to the table but the success of the child is almost exclusively decided on the parenting style and the parenting well the print like their acceptance of the child in the first place because mm-hmm. yeah because there's a lot of parents that I've met right that they won't say it outright <laughs> but they'll say it in in sort of like conversations and stuff of just like, I just want my kid to be typical or just like normal, right? So you're already working with a parent that doesn't, maybe doesn't flat out say it, but already has certain like reservations towards their own child, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that has like a lot of conflicts, of course, with with caregivers and and um, the teachers and uh, the people providing services. Because sometimes it's a child, it's okay for a child to to be like a little weird or like have, you know, flap their hands. Like if if that is self-soothing for them, you know, and and sometimes ABA comes in and it's like, you can't flap your hands, right? Because it makes us uncomfortable. We don't know right. what to right, do with yeah. you when you're flapping your hands, right? And don't get me wrong, there are other behaviors that are um much, much worse than just like flapping hands. Like there's, of course, there's like um, self-injurious behaviors, you know, there's uh, aggressive behaviors, things like that, which of course, you know, you, you can't go to the grocery store if, if you kick every person you see using a, a, a walker or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So there are, of course, specific rules that should be followed, but a lot of times that bleeds over into things that are kind of like, yeah, I mean, like, the kid just like flaps his hands and dances around kind of funny every once in a while, you know, like, like that's okay. In my opinion, that's okay. Right. But for a lot of parents and stuff, it's just like, make them stop doing that. Is it, is there such a thing as like a a separate sort of therapy for parents or is that part of the ABA thing is that, that they get to talk to someone about, you know, whatever it is that they're going through and their feelings, or does that not exist? So there has been um, more recently, definitely um, like a more empathetic approach to parents for sure. Because the thing is, is like when we see the kids, it's only for a handful of hours a week. You know what I mean? Really, they, they're they going to be spending most of the time with their parents, with their family. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's, it's been it been taken into consideration, I think, more recently. Um, and having a child, I don't have children, but I know, I'm sure it's extremely difficult to raise even just like a typical learning child, let alone a child that you may not understand. So I can only imagine how stressful and difficult that may be. So yeah. And, and I think a, a, a big theme for a lot of the parents too, is that they just want their kids to also just be independent. There's definitely that that whole societal um, sort of idea of like you have to earn a living, right? We, we nothing is free, right? Everything costs money, so you have to earn it. You know, they just want their kids to be able to to do that. You know, at the end of the day, right? I mean, you know, it is one of the like there 
a lot of, you know, aut- autistic adults have a huge risk of homelessness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of the facets of, of autism goes against the modern workplace. Yeah. Yep. One of, I guess, you know, features that features of, of autism can be a certain inflexibility about structure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like very rigid. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, things have to follow in a very specific order for That's some, right. right? You know, and if there is any, any smallest changes or the steps get mixed up, you know, then it, it doesn't, it, it does not happen. <laughs> you know, those are things that can make like a lot of work, employment very difficult for a lot of people. So it, it is, you know, it's one of the those things where where autism is one of the areas where, you know, because so much of our care is compartmentalized and we don't have really good wraparound care that's cohesive. Yeah, I wonder, what is the extent of autism? Because if it's a great extent, then you wonder what social programs, if any, are in order <coughs> to help both the children and their parents. And what would you advise if they aren't in place? So I can't speak to the extent of the prevalence of autism in our society, but I do have some, obviously some experience about um, the the procedures in place to help them. And yeah, honestly, the, as far as like getting resources to them, it's, it's extremely limited. And unfortunately, I, I also believe that that is, again, because health insurance costs money, right? And when everything costs money and people are consumers and customers, they expect a certain certain quality or a certain outcome, right? Um, and then you also have the insurance companies who are constantly trying to say no, 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 or reduce the amount of, of hours yeah. available. Um, and, and we all know because it's it's privatized, you know, they have they have to. They're in the business of saying no. So, um, so yeah, so even, so the parents don't even get a catch a break on that front, you know, so they have to be constantly fighting for resources, for funding every year. If, if, if the child is in a, in a private school, a special uh, education school, the parents have to get, have to lawyer up and they have to sit in meetings and depositions and stuff like that. To, to advocate for their child to be placed into a setting that is better suited for, for their learning style. And again, I, I think you can trace it back to society, right? Like if I was to change it, it, it would literally, you'd have to start almost completely over just because our economy is like so exploitative and everything. But uh, I guess like a more realistic approach would probably just be like, let's just fund it. Like, let's just fund the institutions. Like, let's fund the re- fund the research, right? And, and let's, um, like, let's meet them where they're at, right? It's okay if this child, you know, doesn't grow up to, to hold down a, a job, like, and just accepting them and, and their, you know, capabilities instead of like, trying to force them to assimilate into a society that kind of like doesn't care about them and, and, and force them to, to try and live up to our standards as opposed to just like accepting them for who they are and making sure that they are happy, healthy, and as independent as they can be, you know? And I, and I'm talking about independence as like using the bathroom, right? Personal hygiene, getting dressed in the morning, maybe if they're, if they're able to cook food for themselves or go grocery shopping, you know, like work with their limitation, uh, work with their abilities and their limitations and, and, and start from there. I don't know if that answers your question. But. It does a little bit, but it makes me wonder in countries that are more civilized about the way they treat people in socialist countries like the Scandinavian countries, Holland, and increasingly in South America, as they become socialists like Chile and Colombia um, and Uruguay, are they what do they are there any models there for how to deal with autism in a civilized kind way? 
So I can't speak to other countries necessarily, but I do know of certain programs that um, we are exporting uh, ABA to other countries. And I know that there are uh, programs for, for um, they're called uh, BCBAs, BCBA uh, behavior. Oh my gosh, I'm brain farting right now. That's <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I can look it up. <laughs> um, yeah, but they... Um, you know, they export the ideas just like a uh, board certified behavior analyst. Um, so they export the same ideas like our econ- like like what we do for everything else, right? Christianity, the economy, like we export these to other countries and we're sort of like the leader of ABA, I guess you could say, um, the West. One of the things that troubled me is I re- remember reading about B.F. Skinner's daughter who he brought up in a Skinner box with um, behavioral behaviorism, and she went insane. Sure. So I wonder whether the treatments for autistic children that would benefit them would also drive someone else mad, or you know, sort of how to deal with those two things. Yeah. So you're sort of touching on um, another big talking point in ABA at the moment about consent really for the learner and also just a lot of the a lot of the individuals who receive ABA services actually do exhibit symptoms of PTSD as well. Wow. Um, yeah, and there's actually a, a study here. ABA and post-traumatic stress symptoms amongst recipients of ABA, Cooperstein 2018 for um, 460 respondents and then Nearly half of the respondents met the threshold for PTSD, and those exposed to ABA were 86% more likely to meet PTSD criteria than those not exposed. Wow. So, yeah. Ouch. Yeah. So there's definitely something to be said about, about the procedures being used here, right? So Yeah. I wondered if, because it states that it's about changing uh, behavior, and sort of teaching people to sort of to behave how how you want them to. I wondered also if just that does ABA have the ability to look at itself through the same lens that it judges these children? Does it look at its own behavior? Does it learn from its own mistakes? And what mistakes has it made? And it sounds to me like <laughs> maybe the PTSD is is a mistake. Um, so. It sounds really different. I mean, how do you, when you read that study, like, how did you deal with that? You're like, oh my God, am I perpetuating PTSD on people? Like, what was, how have you sort of navigated this? I've been in the field for about seven years now. And this was something that, you know, as I was, as I was, you know, doing it, (laughs) I sort of came to the realization that like, yeah, no, this, I could totally, I totally understand why this is completely traumatic. Um, There's a lot of erasure. I think, um, with, with some of the learners, you know, um, erasure, I, wait, what do you mean by erasure? Just like the, the whole, like, we don't like when you do this. So we're going to figure out a way for you to stop doing that, I even see. though okay. it's not harmful or anything like that. Right. Um, and yeah, and I've actually spoken to a lot of people in the field as well about it and that, you know, they say the same thing. Like there's like this weird balancing act between like, you you know, you, you want to, you obviously want to target the most extreme behaviors, right? If if a child is smashing their head against the wall. Right. Yeah. That's obviously horrible. And you want to, you want to intervene there. And that's the reason ABA came about, right? I assume is because that there were sort of severe behaviors that were like, well, this would be, you know, best case scenario. We just need to sort of, you know, help. I think that's charitable. I think that's a very charitable view, but that's just me. Yes. Okay. Okay. I agree with that as well. Um, just, here's me just being and, an idiot. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's optimistic. <laughs> yeah, no. optimistic idiot. <laughs> but but yeah, but but speaking to your point about um yeah, I mean like you really could teach anyone anything based off of these these principles of of um, ABA, because the thing the thing is with ABA, it, it obviously it stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis, right? The behavior analysis part checks out. The science checks out. You know, 
But the applied part is kind of where the issues lie. It's it's sort of like that's where the ambiguity is. That's sort of like um, that's why you can go to two schools that are like, oh, we we champion ABA techniques, blah blah blah, blah and they'll do things that are completely different from one another so there's like not a lot of like there's not a lot of like uniform mm, continuity across yeah. yeah exactly and it really just depends on the learner uh where where they're coming from what their day-to-day lives look like what expectations they have from their family and everything like that that sort of formulates what how are we applying the behavioral analysis you know like what are we gonna what is important for this learner yeah, so I, I came across the, was it, you know, there's ABA, but there's the ABC, right? Like that's the... Okay, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, you're talking about ABC, uh, the antecedent behavior consequence. That's it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the method, yeah. isn't it? Right? It is. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. C- could you just briefly explain what those are? ABC, antecedent behavior consequence, basically every behavior, observable behavior has something that happens immediately before it and then something that happens immediately after it, right? So whatever leads up to that behavior is considered the antecedent and whatever happens after behavior is the consequence. And depending on the consequence depends on whether or not the behavior is going to increase or decrease, right? So a lot of that, a lot of the times it's kind of like observing a, a learner and seeing Oh, uh, when we present a math problem to this learner, they run away from the table, right? Sounds so the like antecedent, me. obviously, is the present. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> me too. But that's it. Like reading all uh, this stuff, I was like, well, this, you know, this all tracks with everyday stuff like social media sort of works like this. You know, mm-hmm. it keeps you coming back for more based on how you're interacting with it and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, on the ground, it sort of makes sense. Um, yes, absolutely. How, how it works. It's just it's based in science. It really is. Yeah. But it's just ha- like like all this stuff, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's like how it's implemented and why it's implemented. It becomes exactly. the sort of trickier part of it all, right? It does. And it also makes me wonder if an autistic child has a behavior whose consequence is social disapproval, even if it's something as innocent as flapping their arms and making noises, mm-hmm. which cause people in the environment to think, whoa, what's going on? Do those emotional cues impact an autistic child the way they would someone else, that kind of disapproval socially? Or does that social cue not act as a uh, reinforcer that the consequence is no good, so don't do that? Exactly. Yeah, you're touching on exactly that. So that's where the that's where the um, autism part sort of comes in, right? Because you're exactly right. If if a learner flaps their hands and but but doesn't cue into the social uh, feedback that they're getting, that like that's mm-hmm. weird or we don't want to play with you or whatever the case may be, they they don't either pick up on that or they simply don't care. Um, and that's and that's that component for sure. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things where, again, like, you know, it, it is a spectrum disorder. You know, a lot of uh, autistic people do um, feel a crushing sense of isolation, like depression and anxiety is is relatively high in the community. I had one client that had a friend that was autistic and you know and he he dropped by the facility and i was talking to him and he was one of those guys where he was just like you know like a lot of i I just don't sense like you know when people disapprove it just doesn't register and Mm. i don't care so yeah like this guy was like the only friend he's had in his entire life and i was like yeah you know would you like because i was trying to see like if he wanted to you know get hooked up to like you know peer support groups or whatever and he was like no like i'm totally happy with my one friend yeah and then there are you know autistic people that are extremely sensitive to a sense of disapproval yes and that it always speaks to the individual, right? So, like, again, it's a spectrum. It's kind of a grab bag. It, it just depends. You know, you defined autism as kind of a social ineptitude. But if you notice people's disapproval and want to change 
your behavior, then you're not so socially adept, maladept. Well, well you, you know? don't want to change your behavior. That's the thing. You want to be accepted. Yes. Oh, you don't see the logic? If I continue to do this, I won't be socially accepted. I better change it. You don't get the consequence and, and the logic? It's not the consequence and the logic. It's more just like if I flap my hands, who the fuck is it hurting? Right. Right. You know, that's different from like if I if I'm repeatedly bashing my head into the wall and I'm a bloody exactly. mess, you know, exactly. I mean, those are those are very different things. I think like, you know, one aspect of like of autism is there can be like, you know, a very clarifying logic with a lot of autistic people. Right. Of like this isn't hurting you guys. Why do you care? Right. It's just that. That's a good analysis. This isn't hurting you. Why do you care? But if the person cares to be accepted, they might think they're fucked up. However, I better not flap my hands if I ever want to be less lonely. That kind of consequence. Not because there's a great reason for disapproving of flapping, but because you don't want to be alone. A mm. lot of kids don't really understand why they're disapproved of, but they do understand that they're getting disapproved. So they change. Mm -hmm. Is that different for autistic people? Again, like, you know, it depends, right? Like women are diagnosed far less. And women are underdiagnosed um, in the community. And one aspect of it. So, you know, assimilating to more social behavior um, is called masking in the community, uh, right? Uh -huh. And so, like, women are much better at masking. Um, yes. Is that through socialization? Is that through whatever, you know? But, you know, but it's also one of those things where, like, you know, that's where the PTSD comes in. Mm -hmm. A sense of I'm in a place of constant rejection for who I yes. am. And, like, complete ostracization. You know what I mean? Like, just being completely, like, cut off. So it just seems more and more that like the ones with the social problem are actually the majority because <laughs> we can't handle people who are different. Yeah. And in all fairness, I mean, a lot of times, you know, a child will get the ASD um, diagnosis or whatever. But there's also other factors at play, like a lot of, of learners that I've worked with also have ID, right? So an intellectual disability. So right. I mean, like... Mm -hmm. it, there's also like a certain capacity for 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 learning, I guess you could say. But like just accepting them for that, you know what I mean? Is like it's a huge difference between accepting them for who they are and working from there, or trying to get them to these unreasonable goals. In my opinion, they're unreasonable um, to conform to our standards. And our standards ultimately are about being a productive worker. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Do, do you feel like ABA is addressing a need or is it just like a Band-Aid over a, a much bigger problem? Oh, it's it's definitely a Band-Aid over a much larger issue. Um, again, it's sort of... Um, it, ABA is a tool, right? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't like uh, make decisions, right? The person who wields ABA is the one making decisions. So, yeah, I mean, it just depends on a person's like frame of reference and everything, like what they expect of their own child and and what society expects of of them and their family and everything like that. And living in a in a society such as ours, where everything is how productive can you be, you know, like your worth is is determined by how productive you can be, um, and. Yeah, these learners will never reach those standards. Um, and Some, honestly, yeah, no. well, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, sometimes I speak, yeah, but of course, some, um, not to label them all. Um, but even just thinking about uh, how to navigate safely through a city, like how much, how much a cognitive ability a person needs just to safely, safely yeah. move around a city, you right. know, like, so. In my opinion, until we basically completely transform our society to to be everyone has a has a fair uh, stake in it, it, like these these learners, unfortunately, are going to be measured on a scale that's just not fair.
I think. Right, and it's based off a certain amount of assumptions, like what the ideal human is supposed to be and how one's supposed to act. That's exactly. what it's yeah. in service of, right? Yeah, so I, the, there's a good article on, uh, I think it's Psychology Today, I think that's the name of the website. I'll put it in the show notes, and or, or that I might cut this bit out, whatever, um, just because I was going to read a bit from it. Um, which I thought was really interesting. They said, the problem comes when a child's behavior is communicating something that they cannot verbalize. I have come across children who are acting out in school and were being evaluated by myself and others to address challenging behaviors in the school. If the interventions were designed to look at the stimulus of the acting out or the rewards of the acting out behaviors alone, the challenging behaviours would have been extinguished. In one particular case, the fact that the child was being beaten at home with a belt might never have come to light. So we have to be careful to ensure that we have a thorough functional analysis of behaviour and we have to understand the emotional world. That was like, surely that's a huge hole in, yeah. in ABA's apparent sort of toolkit or ability to change stuff. Like, that speaks to... Well, it's everything, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. How do you differentiate who is autistic from who is traumatized? If you okay. don't know the origin, sometimes you don't know the origin of the behavior, but then how could you diagnose somebody with autism if you don't know why they're behaving the way they do? Yeah, so that's that's a great question and a good segue into like sort of where ABA, I think, is headed now. and it's. Um, or at least what I think should <laughs> or it should have be added. And that's called uh, trauma-informed care. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. I'm sure you probably are. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, so that's kind of seeing the individual as a whole and treating treating them as if they are have been traumatized, you know, and just kind of working from there. Right. The difference between like a traumatized person and say like an autistic person is, is, you know, they, they can be similar, but they're again, like autism has like, you know, key, specific key things. Like for example, um, you know, repetitive word use, you know, because verbal, uh, verbal ability can be greatly affected, you know, so nonverbal, like, you know, people that are unable to speak are part of, you know, uh, the, the autistic community. Right. Yes. And I was just, I was literally about to go on about communication because uh, a lot of times communication is impaired to an extent. Um, mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot of like nonverbal learners who, who happen to be my favorite, um, by the way, because you get to teach them, you're, you're basically teaching them how to communicate and communicate their needs and stuff like that. Um, to speak to uh, Liam's point about the lack of communication or ability to communicate. Recently, I, I was working with a child who um, wanted wanted some some fruit, right? And so I had all this fruit; it was all cut up, peeled. It was it was wonderful, and you know he had to do some work to get the fruit, right? So he he has some speech delays, and he's just he's sort of difficult to understand already. But one of the principles of ABA is that when you're working with an individual. The, the reward has to match the work, right? Um, and then there's this other, the other underlying thing of, of motivation, right? So if, if I'm working with a kid, he, he does his work, great, here's your fruit, but you don't give them all the fruit at once, right? Because then you don't have, if, if a child, um, it's called like satiate, doesn't want any more of the fruit, then you can't motivate them again to get more work out of them, right? Um, so in this particular case, I gave the kid some fruit, but he wanted more fruit than that. Um, and I was like, no, like eat what you got. Like that's, that's that. He became very upset, you know, became aggressive, crying, very upset. But I made him do more work to get more fruit. So he didn't even eat the original fruit that I had given him for the first work. He saved it. And then he, he got, he got some more fruit and, um, he literally just wanted all of the fruit at once so that he could take a picture of it on his iPad, but he wasn't able to like communicate Aww. that. Wow. Yeah, so, exactly. Right. So here I am. I'm like, this kid's getting super upset because I'm, I'm denying him access to, to fruit. But he can't you know, explain. And he can't yeah. explain what he, what he wants to do with it. And I'm just following the principles of ABA. You know what I mean? Like, right. 
Right. And then as soon as I realized what he wanted to do, I, I obviously I felt terrible. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't want I don't want someone I'm working with to get that upset and and you know over some over some fruit. You know what I mean? Like it's just fruit. But the, that sort of goes to that's just like an example of like the breakdown in communication is yeah a so huge hard. huge deal for for these learners as well. Yeah. Um, Because a lot of times they just are trying to be like, I want this, I want that, I need this, I need that, you know, that that kind of thing. But they just can't vocalize those needs. Yeah. You know, this is also bringing to mind a little girl that I was with when I was in Head Start. And she didn't want, she wouldn't talk. And she didn't want anyone to touch her. So when we went on a trip and had to, hold hands, she lined her hand with boogers. So nobody wanted to hold her hand, which was rather clever, actually. And um, I was just, I was kind to her. I read to her, you know, I talked to her, even though she didn't talk back. And after a while, she started to hit me. And then after she hit me, she was able to talk. But it wasn't that she was impaired. It was that she didn't have the trust that how she felt would be accepted even if she weren't so pleasing and then slowly over the years she got to be able to have friends and hold hands and talk it's so hard to know with a child yeah uh and there's also a lot of conversation now about um about consent so in aba there's there's levels of prompting right so a prompt is just like giving someone help to get the correct answer um, and then it's, uh, it's on a scale of of like least intrusive to most intrusive. And the most intrusive is called hand over hand or physical guidance, something like that. Uh, so that, that would be like, okay, um, I, I want you to fold this shirt, right? And the, the learner isn't getting it when you show them how to do it, when you like uh, point or whatever. So you have to grab their hands, right? And force them to fold this shirt. Right. Which, again, is is just teaching sort of like compliance or just I'm stronger than you. You have to listen to me, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but uh, an example to counter that for the um, trauma informed care would be they started doing hand under hand. So instead of me putting my hands over their hands to to fold the shirt, I would have them place their hand on top of my hand and then I would fold the shirt. Right. And then they're able to disengage with my hand whenever they whenever they want, right? Which which is something that <laughs> I think ABA needs to needs to the field of ABA needs to take into consideration more is the consent aspect of it, right? Yeah. Because they could respond to the coercion. Exactly. And not get the message. And you're just teaching compliance. You're not even really teaching the skill in, in, in a weird way. Right. That's a really key point of of some of the issues that um, a lot of people have brought up is that people have gone through ABA or like, you know, we didn't learn skills, mm-hmm. right? We learn compliance, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's kind of like the way, like, you know, for example, like, you know, you make kids work for rewards. Yep. Right. Like the, the whole concept in itself is like, you know, I remember talking to one person who actually really liked her ABA therapist in the sense that, you know, her therapist was was very children centered and just a very warm person and she was just like you know I don't have as negative of an experience with ABA because of you know who I worked with yeah she felt I felt like that I learned a lot of skills from her rather than doing things exactly yeah and and that kind of speaks to the direction that I think it should be heading and I think it kind of is heading in a big way of that consent, that cooperation, right? It's not just like you do this because I am the authority figure. You know what I mean? Yeah, autism actually does have a higher uh, population incidence of of drug use and and compulsive drug use. Looking into ABA and, and talking to some autistic people online, and you know, kind of engaging the community a little bit to learn more about it. One of the things about like ABA that felt very familiar to me is you know how we do drug treatment, and, and ultimately like you know, how we treat vulnerable populations in general, right, is this enforcement and coercion 
of standards rather than working with the individual. So the drug treatment facilities, just, you know, who you are is is not as important as just stop doing this one thing. And that's what we're going to call success. Which is, yep. and that's what we're going to call success, right? So if you if you stay away from drugs, that that's that's the only metric that matters. And you know, with the abstinence only type of um, treatment being dominant in the industry, you know, but just kind of knowing the ins and outs of that aspect of treatment and reading about ABA felt very familiar. Yeah talking to like a lot of uh, now adults that went through special ed Mm -hmm. a major common thread in order to be considered human you need to we we are going to enforce standards to you you have no say right yeah somebody made a a really interesting comment once um, which was if you want to experience a little bit of what autism might be like it's like being thrown in a culture where you don't speak the language that's very different from yours Mm -hmm. now are there ways that you can look at a brain and tell whether that brain is autistic i don't know um i suspect that we could eventually get to that point but i don't think there's anything like that now because I, I think most of the time the diagnosis happens well after birth, you know, within the first few years of, of life. So, so I don't think there's anything like before birth that, that could that could tip it off. Or even after or, birth. Or I mean, or I guess yeah. Suspect someone's autistic. Is there a way to know besides some signs of behavior which might have various origins? I know there is a lot of brain imaging studies around autism. I haven't seen anything that, like, you know, I, I've seen certain things speaking to, like, activity in the brain. But I haven't seen anything that, that seemed very definitive with. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot unknown here, which is important to know if you're going to treat people humanely and allow them to develop to whatever capacity they have. Yeah, that's so true because that is a that is a limitation of ABA because you are only literally looking at the exhibited behaviors, right? Yeah. There's there's no like internal processes or anything like well, I mean, they're taken into consideration, right? But um they're usually not seen as like motivation. Most of the motivation seem is is mostly like external. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. There's a really good well. I, I, I don't know if I'd still find it good, but back in the day, I read this book called Drive by Daniel Pink, and he talked a lot about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And there was one mm-hmm. study where, with kids where they gave them money for doing art. And, you know, they like a little factory, they produce loads of art to get some money. But then it killed the desire to do art. Um, you can see that nowadays. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so that sort of sh- sh- extrinsic reward kill- killed the flame of the internal thing. And so that is a really difficult, you know, if that translates to the, the kind of therapy space that you're in, then that is really tricky, isn't it? Because yeah. mm-hmm. how you navigate all of that stuff. Uh, I mean, this, yeah, I guess this is the other thing. Presumably you're working with particular individuals for any length of time, either a short amount of time or a long period of time. And I assume if it's a long period of time, the people getting that treatment are ultimately people with cash. Like how available is ABA for like, you know, regular folks? So I think it kind of goes along the same lines as, again, our economy, right? If you have money, life's a lot easier. Um, You know, you you get access to the best health care, the best food, the best care. Yeah, the best everything. Uh, I, I worked at a place in Florida where we had uh, we we worked with the most like behavioral intensive uh, learners, talking about like the self interest behaviors and the aggressions and everything like that. And they had ba- basically had been expelled out of all the other schools in the state that dealt with this. This was sort of like their last chance kind of thing. And the amount of overlap between poverty or close to like levels of poverty and these specific learners was like i mean the venn diagram was practically a circle you know what i mean like yeah it's there's a very strong correlation you know like between having money and getting access to to services that sure you need yeah well in a capitalist system 
the market decides just about everything. And so if you don't, those who have the money have access. Well, I did know one family who had a autistic daughter and they had somebody coming in to, you know, they weren't dance lessons, right? But like dance therapy, art therapy, who was very, very keen on like sound. So like, you know, bought a bunch of instruments and let her play various instruments and, you know, and they, and it was wonderful, right? Yeah. I mean, regardless of, of any kind of diagnosis, one of the, in a sense, like happiest kid I, I, I've seen in my life in, in, in many ways of, you know, very mm-hmm. supportive family, you know, who was just really trying to, you know, because that's one of the things about like, I think things like applied behavioral therapy, this sense of like, it kind of robs you of your childhood mm-hmm. in a way that it discourages play. Yep. Or what they consider play that, that, you know, isn't necessarily respected. This was, you know, a child that was having like this, this full childhood where their parents were trying to be very supportive of, of supporting her interests and her strength. Just like really nice that, you know, her parents were, were going through like non-coercive ways to like allow her to express herself uh, uh, and do her own kind of communication. They were a very wealthy family. You know, they had, yep. they were able to have, I mean, she basically, they hired like, you know, a nanny just for her to that, that was lived in, you know, in addition to all these like additional you know, Services. things. And, and yeah, and this is denied of like regular children, right? Like we don't have mm-hmm. art in schools anymore. This is a capitalist system. Yeah, ABA therapy programs can help increase language and communication skills, improve attention, focus, social skills, memory and academics, decrease problem behaviors. Like Those all sound like awesome things. And in some ways, you know, that's what any good uh, teacher or guardian or parent would do. And it's kind of interesting hearing uh, equal you talk about someone who had positive experiences with ABA and it's, uh, you know, the, the parallel really is when you get a good teacher and then that becomes your subject, you know, you don't give a shit about geography or maths, but you have a really good teacher and then you like, that's something you care about it. That's something you end right. up being very enthused by. And it's just, it comes down to that. Yeah. You can have all the sort of formal metrics of measuring something, but if you have a sort of a human being that you connect with, then that changes that changes everything. So I can understand yep. why you would want to formalize a process that's going to help people, but you know, best case scenario. But it sounds like to me that at the minute it's so non cohesive <laughs> that yeah. it very varies in terms of the quality that it really obviously just comes down to whether, yeah, you click with the kids, whether the kids click with you, and sort of the and whether you see them as yeah. human. Yeah, Whether you, rather than as objects to be um, reformed. Because exactly. if you looked at Helen Keller, they thought, you know, that she couldn't learn mm-hmm. either. And she was brilliant. Right. You know, I mean, it, it's it's one of the things that's kind of consistent with, you know, if we're talking like a systemic bent on this, is that, you know, if you are a marginalized population, right, that quality mm-hmm. of care that gets applied yeah. to is going to often be inconsistent. It's going to be focused on expedience. Yes, that's another big issue. Yep. Right. And that getting results quickly. Right. And that it is more often going to be more punitive in nature than acceptance and validation and care. Yeah. Whether you are, you know, somebody that is homeless with a severe drug issue or you are an autistic child or an adult, right? You are considered, especially if you do not have the trappings of, of you know, money or wealth or, you know, certain social capital that you you are being seen as a, as a you know, unproductive member of society and society's job is to whip you into shape, you know, 100%. not, you know, kind of uh, work not, not so that you, you enjoy your life right <laughs> yeah. right right i mean that's, that's one of the i think that you know because like you know kind of like you know this 
this this woman that had a positive ABA experience, you know, like she's like, yeah, I've talked to a lot of, you know, other people, you know, like what you got doesn't sound like ABA, right, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. You know, and again, like, you know, it's one of those things or one aspect of therapy is that like how the therapist approach, you know, uh, a therapist can make the most compassionate modality into punitive torture. Yes. And and most of the ABA practices are based on um, punishment. Yeah. So, which is scary. Definitely. I mean, there's such an interaction between capitalism's hatred for any dysfunction mm-hmm. and the kind of also the different care depending on the money that people have or want to devote to a child who is needful or an adult who is needful, that those things get commingled inextricably with care. Um, and, to, and to speak to a little bit on like individual therapist styles and stuff, and I hope like none of my employers <laughs> hear this, but like I, I tend to try and go into sessions and, and stuff like that with the, with the mindset of like, hey, I'm going to follow your lead, right? I'm going to make sure that like you're safe. Hopefully like you'll learn you'll learn something something new or a new skill. way to communicate. Yeah, right. And, and just meet them at their level. But to, but to be 100% honest with you, my the main goals for any session that I try to lead is, are they safe? Are they happy? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like very basic. Yeah, of course. Because without that, they're not going to learn, even though they might be tormented into showing behavior. They may not, That doesn't mean they're learning. Exactly right. And just meeting them at their level, like I said before. So, obviously, this has been quite a critical conversation, and and necessarily so by the sounds of it. <laughs> but um, are there sort of positives that you know something in it that you have seen that is kind of progress to you or feels rewarding? Or okay, I'll just share another story. I had a learner hated brushing his teeth, right? But our diets today kind of require brushing teeth, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so he hated he hated doing it, and I to to desensitize him to brushing teeth. Right, I would stand in front of him, or I'd stand with him in front of a mirror with you know toothpaste on a toothbrush, and gradually over time, you know, get him more used to being around it, get him more used to it, and um, you know, kind of show him that like he he was nonverbal, um, just to show him that like yeah, like brushing your teeth is like it's healthy. It's good for you. Like, and we got to do it. Right. Um, and I would stand with him for like 45 minutes with just like a toothbrush in his hand. And as soon as he took the toothbrush and he put it up to his mouth, cause he, he knows what you have to do with it, you know, and he'd put it up to his mouth and then that was it. You know what I mean? And then everything would go away. And then the next day we would try it again. And then it would, I would require a little bit more. And then that's sort of like how you can use ABA to like desensitize a child to something that is like kind of routine, mundane, uh, but also helps them be independent. Right. Necessary. Like hygiene is, is, is a good thing. Right. Yeah. So things like that, I love. Um, things like communication, like when we have a communication breakthrough, that is like, that is like one of the only reasons why I'm even able to continue, continue in the field because um, of those big moments where it's like, Again, that kid with the that kid with the fruit. After that, I was like, I again, a time and over re- repetitive was like, oh, I want to take a picture. You could say, I want to take a picture. I want to take a picture. You know what I mean? And so instead of getting all upset and and everything like that and getting aggressive, just being able to say, I want to take a picture, like that, it, it makes such a huge difference in the quality of this kid's life, right? And you don't have to get all upset and you don't have to be aggressive. And it's small victories like that, I think, that make it worth it when you're actually like helping. And this conversation continues on our Patreon. So why not join us over at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell and Sheena Belmas. 
If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolf and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.